We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. 2 Corinthians chapter 7. That's where we're going to be. Communication, comfort, conduct, confidence. There's another C in there that I didn't put. But these are the four that we're going to be walking through in this passage this morning. Communication, comfort, conduct, and confidence. We're going to find those, another C word, concepts <laughs> in this passage. And as we go to this passage this morning, we're going to explore uh, these as they relate to us walking with the Lord and dealing with oftentimes relational problems within a church and that God does give direction on how that works in an assembly, uh, a church gathered together to glorify him. And I think it's healthy for us. It's, uh, honestly, I think so much of our Bible is really counseling to the individual life, uh, how God wants us to know him, how God wants us to walk with him, and how God wants us to interact with those around us in a way that looks like him. And I think we need that message. Amen? Well, at least I, I hope you think we need it because here we are with the word of God to come and visit us where we are. So I hope you'll open your hearts to the message today. And if you don't know Christ, I hope you'll take time in our fellowship to talk about Jesus. And uh, I think for our regular attenders, don't take it for granted that everybody around you knows Christ. Um, not only can you get to know someone's name, but you get to know where they are spiritually and how you can maybe be of help. And uh, we often say you can't minister well to people you don't know. So you have to take time. You have to take time to get to know people around you and know what's going on in their life, know who they are so that you can minister Christ one to another. And I want to say thank you to the ladies that played the offertory. If you didn't know the name of that song is Lord, I Need You. And we do. And I hope you can own that. Uh, if you don't know him this morning, we hope you do recognize your need for him. But believers, we know we need him, right? We know we need his uh, help, intervention, comfort in our lives. And thank the Lord that he is there. You know, one of the things that you wind up describing yourself as a pastor as you often can describe yourself as a professional communicator. And if you ever want to uh, have a deflated view of yourself as a communicator, just ask people after they've listened to you, what did you say? And uh, that might give you a healthy perspective of yourself. But communication is necessary. Matter of fact, in many homes, uh, one of the key marks of an unhealthy relationship is a lack of communication, a lack of working with each other, talking with each other, finding out about each other. And that is a concept that actually has some biblical grounding as we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, we're going to be picking up in verse 12, but what we've come to so far is a place in Scripture where the Corinthians had repented and had come to the Lord in repentance, and they'd sorrowed after a godly sort. So there was, uh, in Paul's discourse with the Corinthians, he's dealing with them in regard to uncomfortable things. And I began this segment of our study uh, a week or two ago where I asked our people, do you like confrontation? Well, most of us, most of us would say no. And it's easier to say something about something uh, when you have a problem with someone, when you're not talking to the person that you have a problem with. Matter of fact, we often will handle communication in every way that can be wrong. But God gives a direction for how that communication should look. And so this morning, we're going to read out loud verses 12 through 16. So you got your Bibles there. <coughs> got your Bibles there. And we're going to read verses 12 through 16 out loud. Would you join me? Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort. Yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. For if I have boasted anything to him of you, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. And his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembered the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling you received him. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you all. 
excuse me, confidence in you in all things. Yeah, see, that's what you get for following me. <laughs> all right. Uh, in this passage, we start where Paul begins in verse 12, wherefore, though I wrote unto you. This writing of Paul was a communication, obviously divinely led, inspired scripture here, but divinely led that there needed to be a communication with the Corinthians. Now, I want to, again, address this as our beginning. Communication is necessary for believers to operate in a way that glorifies Christ. What that communication looks like, however, can look ungodly if we don't follow the directives that God gives. Now, just a few counseling moments already. And let me, you know, again, the way that we can misapply this in our relationships is astounding, but very often we do exactly the wrong thing. Matter of fact, when husband and wife get upset with each other in a home, how can you often tell that one is upset with the other? Have you ever heard of the phrase, do you know it? The silent treatment. See, you already know it. And, and it's, a, it's a thing, right? It's a thing. And we can live in our carnality where in our stubbornness, we refuse to talk. We refuse to open the door to communication. And it really bears itself out back in that verse two. What are the first two words of verse two? First two words of verse two. What are they? First two words. Receive us. And what we do is we close the door of communication and we get entrenched in our wrong or our right. And all we see is our position and we stop looking at the person. And Paul, when he starts this section here in verse 12, upon this repentance that has happened in the Corinthians, he tells them that he wrote unto them for, for specific purpose. So I'm starting this morning by saying that communication needs to happen amongst God's people for us to have a healthy relationship. Let me ask you, have you ever misread somebody? Yeah, you got to be leery of people that believe they have a sixth sense to be able to know where people are without communication. I, I can just read them. The problem is, we aren't books, and you don't always really know what's going on with a person just by what you happen to see in the flash of a moment. You actually have to get to know what's going on in their lives. I often say that relationships are not rocket science. People do what they do for a reason. And when you see someone react in a way that may not make sense to you, we often will do, it became a thing some years ago where someone was prone to say, well, that doesn't make sense, as if that ended the conversation. And part of the reason I can say, well, that didn't make sense is because we didn't take time for it to make sense. If you were to explore why a person behaves the way they do, you might have a lot more understanding if you took time to know them, and if you took time to communicate with them. But what happens is we stop loving people and stop treating people like people that need the love of Christ, and we entrench ourselves in our pride, in our position, and all communication stops and breaks down. That is not what happened with Paul and the Corinthians. Instead, he took the initiative when something was broken to step in and hope that through that communication and through his demonstration of the love of Christ, that God would break through into those people and make an entrance to be received. Now, it wasn't just about receiving Paul as a person. Paul, the importance of receiving him as a person was the importance of receiving the message that he carried. And what happens even in coming to a congregation and having a, a man stand up and speak before you, you can make it about the man and forget the message that's, that is being given. And we have to have an openness to receive that communication. Otherwise, we can walk out of this place the same way we, can, we came in, only just a little bit harder. So communication is necessary. And where that's broken, it needs to be fixed. And Paul says, I wrote unto you. I, I wrote unto you. But he starts with why he did not write. He did not, and it sounds a little odd here. He gives two reasons that he did not write. And in this, there, these two things are, 
one, to address the one that did the wrong. And there's a lot of, um, a lot of um, commentary given to what was the wrong that he was talking about. There are two or three different issues. One could have been uh, 1 Corinthians 5, uh, the sin that was of immorality that was going on in the church. Another major theory is the sin of uh, the false teachers within the church trying to pull people to themselves. There are some other theories that go behind uh, the reasons for the writing. But he says, I didn't write to necessarily address the one that did the wrong. And then also, I didn't write to correct or to, to address the one that suffered wrong. So I didn't write for any of those two reasons. Even though those things come up in these books, 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, that's not necessarily the foundation for which he was writing. Wherefore, though I wrote unto you, I did it not for his cause that had done the wrong, nor for his cause that suffered wrong. So a time out here before I go into why he did write. You and I in church life, you with me? Okay, we're together. You and I need to be careful about being drawn in to individual incidents. You know what I'm saying? So somebody's got an offense, somebody's got a problem, and when somebody's got a problem, what do they want? They want somebody to come along behind them and amen their problem. And then they want somebody else to amen that problem as well. And another, and what it becomes is a distraction off of the eye, looking off of Jesus. And now we're all involved in this incident. So just as an admonition in the passage, he says, I'm not really dealing with anyone who did the wrong or with, uh, or the person that was wronged. Instead, I'm writing for a different reason. And that is to make clear his care for them in the sight of God and that his care would appear or be apparent unto them. Now, just as a side note here, I'm not going to dwell with this long, uh, but some of you have different translations that actually change the meaning of this, uh, and there's a lot of debate behind uh, how this is translated. But I believe the way it's translated here is accurate and has implication for all of us, and it, it makes uh, uh, clear sense. I only say that for a moment because I know some of you are using a different version. It's going to actually change some of the meaning here. So he says, I wrote not for these other two reasons, but that our care for you in the sight of God might appear unto you. So here's the thing. Uh, it's, al it's always delicate to have a conversation where there's confrontation and you're dealing with a hard issue. Let me ask you this. Have you ever walked away from a conversation and thought later, oh, I should have said? Have you thought later, man, I could have said it differently? Now, by the way, sometimes we say that blind of how what we say is going to be received. And then we hear how it's received and then we think, oh, I could have made that more clear if I would have known that was how it was going to be received. But now I've got to come and I've got to do something. What do I have to do? I have to communicate. I actually have to take the time. And by the way, communication, are, are you with me? Some, are we good communicators? How can you tell if somebody's a good communicator? Sometimes you can tell if someone's a good communicator by watching them listen and letting them have time to speak. And I'm, I don't say, and by the way, I, I don't think we ever get done practicing communication, God, godly communication. But one of the tactics that I use, especially in difficult situations, is once I hear somebody, I will say back to them what they've said and ask, did I get it right? So that I, at least in making sure that we're hearing the same thing. But he's making clear for them, not these side issues that were real issues. But he's writing for this major purpose. To make clear his care for them. He says, ultimately, when he says, in the sight of God, it's God that makes us do right if we're going to do right at all. So the right motive for godly communication is God himself. So I, I want to throw this out there for free, okay? We say this often. 
when you are seeking for a spouse, you're not just looking for someone that you get along with. You're looking for someone who loves Jesus. And all God's people should say, amen. The motivating factor in my marriage that makes me communicate and try to do the right thing is never because I'm a good person. If I was a good person, we probably wouldn't ever have conflict. But what makes a marriage a healthy marriage is where the Holy Spirit pricks the heart and puts pressure on the heart. And because you love God and know that you are in the wrong, you seek to make it right by communication and to speak with clarity. So Paul, and and this is what I'm saying, sometimes when we listen or have conversations about conflict, our conflict is bound to this. I am going to tell you what problem I've got with you. And if we're going to be right, you're going to receive what I'm going to say, and you're simply going to say, I'm sorry I did that to you. Have you ever heard uh, that it takes two to tango? I don't know where that phrase comes from because I don't know what a tango is, but is it, is it a dance? You want to show me? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> but it takes, it takes two, apparently. It takes two. I get off on these things and my wife goes like this. <laughs> uh, so... For godly communication to happen, I'm not just talking about the home. It obviously applies in the home, but it applies in the body here. And that's his language. His language is to make clear his care for the church in the sight of God and that it might appear unto them. The reason for writing is really the whole church context, that the church context might be a healthy context. And that's why he takes the effort to take up pen and write a hard message. A message that is confrontational, but latent with love. It's infused throughout the communication, loving and loving and loving, and yet communicating even when you're fearful of how it will be received. And this is really at the heart of why many of us let conflict or let unresolved conflict go, is we're afraid of how we'll be received. And in that fear, we would rather not have the confrontation and be rejected and live with that brokenness than actually do the right thing and communicate the love of Christ. The residual application is that individual sins and squabbles are detrimental to the work of Christ. So while he didn't write to address the sinner particularly or the one who had been offended particularly, there was addressing of those, but the application is that those issues, those sins and squabbles in the body are detrimental to the work of Christ. And if you've been around Christianity at all, you've seen it. You've seen where somebody had a problem in the church Somebody else took up that problem. Now there's this group and that group, and there's fightings. And guess what? None of it looks like Jesus. And it is, is, is it any wonder then that churches not only go through a split, but go through great, long-lasting bitterness issues that live forever in those people that never sought resolution because they did not communicate? What is the answer? Make sure that we communicate clearly the love of Christ one to another. And all God's people said. He says that our care for you in the sight of God might be evident or appear unto you. Now, I I want to say this is a two-way street. Uh, Again, some of you would choose maybe rather not to engage with people because you don't want to be hurt. Or you don't want someone, you don't want to give the energy that's necessary to engage with someone to try to help them. 
But I want to tell you, it's the love of Christ that motivates us to demonstrate Christ one to another. And it has to be on purpose. And it has to be done clearly. And sometimes you have to say it. So, you know, I have to tell you, my, my, my favorite people to hug are men who are not used to hugging. I, I, I try to do a man hug. Pastor Phil, can you come up? I got to show him what a man hug is. Now, what I did over there with Derek was, it was, it was great sorrow over losing the Pinewood Derby stuff. But I will often come up to another man, I'll, I'll grab his hand, and we'll do, do the man hug. And, and I'll do that with some of you. Oh, you got to do it to me. Here's how some of you do it. You hug me. You hug me. No, you got to uh, hug. Like you want to like you? Yeah, hug me like you like. Uh, uh, uh. Okay, that was weird. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's some of you men not going to get anywhere near me today. <laughs> I'm reminded of Steve Pettit. He's president of Bob Jones University. I'm reminded of when he said he went to some, I want to say some place in Russia. And uh, the culture of the people's different. And they have a fellowship time like we do. But their culture is to kiss. And men kiss men. Women kiss women. And he turned around. And I don't know what the word was. He said he gave some, there was a, a, a bearded Russian man behind him. And, and he said, I must have had the fear of the moment in my eyes. Because he threw open his arms and, and said some Russian word and swallowed him up in an embrace. And by the way, this was not one of those kiss on the cheeks. <laughs> Steve said he flat out kissed him on the mouth. And released him and said some Russian word, you know. Um, so aren't you glad that we're not in Russia right now? So you're glad. <laughs> uh, anyway, but you have to actually step, hello, you have to actually step out and show people that you love them. You have to say it. You need to communicate it. And I think we need to know that we love each other because of Christ. And it's right to say it. It's right to find a way to express it. And I don't think you have to be sappy like me. You don't have to do it like somebody else. But somehow, somehow it needs to become clear within the body that we love each other because of Jesus. Otherwise, we're, we're, we're dismantled one issue at a time. One issue and one offense at a time. And it's impossible that offenses will come. But when they come, what keeps you together? Loving Jesus and communicating it. And Paul took up a pen to write that message. And I'm telling you, we've got to say it. Now, dads, you need to say it to your kids. You need to say it to your wife. Mom, you need to say it to your husband. You need to say it to your kids. But you need to say it to people around you. You've got to find a way to express that you love people because of Christ. Residually, while Paul said he did not address the sinner or the one offended, one last application before we move on to verses 13 and 14, you and I need to make sure that our lives don't damage the work of God. Now, your influence matters. It's going to come up later in this message, but your influence you carry with you everywhere you go, every time you interact with people, your influence matters. And who you are in Jesus matters. I'm going to say it again. You're probably tired, sick of hearing it. But we need to be builders, not breakers. We need to be builders and not breakers. And that's edification in the body of Christ. That's what God ordains his church to be. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 13 and 14. Therefore, I'll start here with verse 13. Therefore, we were comforted in your comfort, yea, and exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. We are comforted in your comfort. What's he talking about? Why, why are the Corinthians, why are, why are they comforted? Look back at verse 7. Read it out loud with me. 2 Corinthians 7, 7. Read it out loud with me if you would. 
and not by his coming only, but by the consolation wherewith he was comforted in you when he told us your earnest desire, your mourning, your fervent mind toward me, so that I rejoiced the more. Why were the Corinthians comforted? We are comforted in your comfort. The reason he was encouraged because of their comfort is that they found comfort in being right with God. Now, it's going to come up, it's going to be a little bit sloppy because this point comes throughout these verses. I'll tell you one of the most uncomfortable things that you can be as a Christian is not right with God. And you might be feeling it in this room this morning. And we often call that being broken, and you don't have to be. So this is both a salvation message and a sanctification message. Salvation, you know in your heart if you're not right with God in salvation. You know that. The Holy Spirit speaks to your heart even at this moment, and you don't have to stay broken. You can come to Jesus for forgiveness this day, and he will wash all of your sins away and reconcile you to himself. All God's people, amen, right? Right, that's the message that he gives to the world. But believer, for you too, there, there may be something broken and, and you think, listen, I don't, some of you, I, this is, it's hard not to make this just about marriage because I know so many struggle in their marriages, but some of you are living broken in your marriage and you don't have to. You can do the right thing and you can start looking like Jesus. And I'm telling you that if you think, and if you're living application in your life like there's no hope, that is the clue that you're not looking like Jesus in your marriage. Because Jesus is the author of hope. God is the God of hope. He is a fixer of broken things. But when we respond in a godly way to confrontation, you know what it brings? It brings comfort. It brings joy. And that's why Paul can say, I am comforted in your comfort. In verses 9 and 10, we look at that last week of, of how that sorrow in their lives worked to bring about health. Verses 9 and 10. Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you, may, you were made sorry after a godly manner that she might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow works repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, not to be sorry for, but the sorrow of the world works death. Here's the thing. He is comforted in their comfort because when a Christian gets right with God, it leads to all good things. So right here in this room right now, you get to make a decision. Are you going to stay broken? Or through the confrontation of God's letter to your heart, will you surrender? And start by communicating with God first. Lord, I've been wrong in this area. Lord, I've been hanging on to this in this area. Lord, I've not repented in this area. Lord, I've got this thing going on. You know it and I know it. And by the way, God knows it far better than I do. It's not the preacher's job necessarily to tell you where you're not right with God. It's your walk with God where he is telling you what's broken. But the answer is repentance. And it brings comfort when we do. Now, it didn't just bring comfort to them. It brought comfort to Paul. It encouraged his heart. And this is exactly how it is with believers. Believers, have you ever known somebody walk away from God? Let's talk a little bit. Have you known people to walk away from God? Have you prayed for them? Have you been brokenhearted? Have you, have you shed tears over people who've walked away from God? Let me ask you, what's your response when you see that person come to Christ? What's your response when you see that person get saved? Isn't your heart comforted? Doesn't it encourage you to see someone who is defiantly living against God turn, repent, come to Christ in salvation, this is really 1 Corinthians. 
They come to Christ in salvation and they are reconciled. Isn't that an incredibly powerful testimony of the grace of God? That God doesn't give up on us, that God doesn't give up on people, He still works in their hearts to bring them to repentance. And when that happens, by the way, let me ask you something. Isn't it true that that's more rare than common? That someone actually does repent and does turn? And what it does is it causes us even that much more joy because we don't see that happen often. Sometimes people in their brokenness are willing, as I've said many times here, willing to take it to the grave. But good things happen with godly repentance. So he was comforted by their comfort. He said, exceedingly the more joyed we for the joy of Titus because his spirit was refreshed by you all. So we've looked so far at communication and comfort, but I want to talk here for a moment about conduct. So in this last part of the verse, and exceedingly the more he was comforted and joyed, exceedingly the more joyed, We, for the joy of Titus, because his spirit was refreshed by you all. The exceeding joy that Titus experienced was a reflection of the conduct of the Corinthian church in receiving him. So this might get lost on you this morning if you don't take some time to focus with me. Here we are as a church this morning, and in this gathering, people are experiencing, or not, Jesus by our interaction with one another. People are coming to fellowship today. And in this assembly, they are witnessing or experiencing or not Jesus or the lack thereof in you. What is their experience as they come to fellowship and interact with you? See, here's the idea. Titus and Paul's interaction was not just with a body of people as a blanket statement, but it was individual upon individual upon individual upon individual that comprised the church. And in the comprising of that church, there was a reception of Paul, there was a reception of Titus, and that demonstration of Christ-likeness is always a warm and receiving thing to those people who are experiencing it. And that's what happens right here. So let's take a moment. I know that some of you, by the way, uh, in some ways I apologize, in some ways I, I don't. Uh, I understand that the way we do things here is maybe not like everywhere, and it doesn't make the way we're doing things the right way to do it. But in the fellowship time, I know for some of you, you would rather that be maybe 30 seconds. And I get it. And by the way, it's not lost on me the grace that you extend and that you continue to attend when you know that we give such attention to that fellowship. But why do we do that fellowship? That fellowship is not just a social introduction. It is, it's kind of like Paul saying, we don't have, we didn't write, he didn't write this letter to address this issue, these issues. That may happen. He really wrote for this reason. Well, we, we do this fellowship the way we do it, not to have just social interaction. The goal is that we who know Christ would minister Christ one to another. That's the goal. The goal is to get to know you some, to begin to again and again, try to get your name, to try to find out a little bit about your life, to try to understand who you are, and in understanding that, minister Jesus. Now, by the way, that's for someone who's new to fellowship, but church, do you understand what I'm saying? This place is not a passive place of worship. It can be that, but it's not supposed to be. I am not the only minister here. Amen? Amen. He and I and the retired pastors here are not the only ministers here. You are the minister of Christ. And your ministry matters. 
People are going to walk away from this place, either having experienced Jesus or not, and that involves you. Now, I don't, I don't, by the way, I don't think, I don't think that's unfriendly to say. <laughs> I don't think I'm being confrontational. I think I'm being apparent with what the scriptures are teaching here that Titus was refreshed by his reception of the Corinthian church. And we have that power because of Jesus right here in this room. Let me ask you something. Is Jesus lovely? Is Jesus worthy of adoration? Does Jesus give you hope? Are you encouraged because of Jesus in your life? It doesn't just have to happen here, but this is a great place to talk about Jesus. This is a great place to find encouragement as we, if you're here you, and, and you're new to church, you've already found out that this assembly doesn't come because there's a great speaker. <laughs> this assembly comes to worship God. This assembly comes together with like mind to lift up the name of Jesus. We embrace him. We rally around him. We love him. We adore him. We're grateful for him. And we want you to know him too. And not only do we want the lost to know him, we want our brothers and sisters who are struggling to be encouraged by him. Lord, I need you, Jody, Jolinda. Lord, I need you. And we do. Verse 14 is comfort and conduct of the church. The conduct of the church was encouraging because they had received the message. He says, for I have, if I have boasted anything to him of you, this is Paul talking about Titus, I am not ashamed. Now, this may seem a little strange, but Paul had boasted to Titus about the Corinthian church. Now, that's hard for us to see because 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians is dealing with a lot of problems in the Corinthian church. But he boasted about the Corinthians to Titus, and he says, I am not ashamed, but as we spake all things to you in truth, even so our boasting, which I made before Titus, is found a truth. Why is that so? Well, first of all, love speaks the truth. We'll come to that in a second. But he says he's boasted of them, and I think this is my personal opinion. All right Now, I, I've had to do this. It's never fun to do it, okay? But I've had to do this, and I, I, I will tell you again, a few messages ago, I've sent messages to people where I'm trying to speak into their lives, saying, please receive me, receive the message I have for you, because the message I have for you is nothing but good. Why? Because it's based on the truth of God's word. And all I can do on outside of that message is speak the truth and pray that somehow that message will get through. That the Holy Spirit will work in their heart to open their heart and receive it. So I communicate the love of Christ. I communicate and communicate and come back to the love of Christ. But in that message, I will also say things like, you are better than this. I know that you can do right here. And sometimes I think we also need to take time to give that hope to brothers and sisters who are struggling. And it's actually the hope that I'm giving from this pulpit because of the truth of the word of God. The broken in your life doesn't have to stay that way. You can do right. Amen? You can make a good choice today. What's Pastor, uh, Pastor Phil's phrase? Love God, make good choices, something like that. Did I get it right? Yeah, there it is. Love Jesus, make good choices. You can. God's given you that opportunity, and that can happen right here today. So if you don't know him, come to know him. Make that choice. But if something is broken, make the choice. So Paul boasted of the Corinthians. Somehow he looked in their lives, and he offered hope and encouragement, spoke that to Titus. 
Now, this is, this is not related to the message, but just so I can give you the phrase. It's something applicationally that I, I find that I, I want to attain to. But somebody said this one time and it just kind of stuck with me. Now, I don't know about this one word, deserve. But they said people deserve to be remembered for their best moments, not their worst. I don't know about deserve, but I would say out of obligation of loving someone in Christ, it would be healthy for us to remember people for their best moments and not their worst. But that's going to take letting go of bitterness and letting go of faults and letting go of whatever it is we're hanging on to. Ephesians 4.15 says this, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. Who are we trying to look like here? Amen, Amen, right? Who are we trying to be like? Jesus. That's who we're trying to fashion ourselves after. Verse 15. We're still looking at the conduct. Verse 15. And as his inward affection is more abundant toward you, whilst he remembereth the obedience of you all, how with fear and trembling ye received him. Why was Titus encouraged? He was encouraged because in that church, individual believers received him and received the message that he was given, received Paul, received the message that Paul had had given. And in that remembrance, there is this phrase, the obedience of you all. They were obedient. What does this phrase with fear and trembling mean? Well, just look back up at verse 11. And in verse 11, you find what all the fear and trembling was around. It was around sin and the grievous nature of sin. For behold, this selfsame thing that she sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, and all things ye have approved yourselves to be clear in this matter. The fear and trembling, I think, was a result of saying, you know what? We have humbled ourselves under the truth of the message of God through his servants, and we don't want anything to do with that destroyer of sin any longer. They became obedient. All right, uh, a clarity moment here for everyone. There is no better position in life than trying to live a life right with God. I'm not saying anybody in this room is perfect, but we are certainly striving after Jesus. Amen? So he's who we're striving after. He's the one that we're trying to follow. And what I'm trying to say here this morning is it is miserable to live a life outside of Christ. It's dark. It's chasing one trinket after another only to find that they don't satisfy. It's chasing one thing and one thing and one thing and and thinking that one thing or that person, if I just had, we talked about this in our Sunday school class, you know, if I just had my house paid for, if I just had... If I just had a nice, a nice Ford truck, <laughs> nice Ford truck. I don't know if that sentence goes together. Nice, never mind. Okay. If I just had a husband, if I just had a wife, if I just had, if I just had, if I just had, and what you're going to find, there is only one person that satisfies in his life, in your life, and that person's name is Jesus. Come to Jesus. Be obedient to him. You see, sometimes we think, and I, by the way, you have to know, I'm not, I'm not unique here. You have probably been here as well, but have you ever talked to someone who is stubborn as the day is long? I'm reminded, I'm reminded of a farmer. Animal activists aren't gonna like this. I'm reminded of a farmer who had a, uh, a newbie to farming come to his his farm and he had a mule and the farmer with this guest went up to this mule and the farmer had told the mule, directed the mule to do something and what the mule do? Well, the farmer was carrying a two by four. They took that two by four and he brought that two by four squarely down upon the forehead of that mule 
dust flies off of his fur, shakes its head, and the guy saying, so what did you do that for? He said, well, I just needed to get his attention. And you'd be lying to say that there are people in your life that you haven't wanted to do that to. Where if a two by four could get through, you'd love to be a son of thunder. But here's what I know. We cannot control anyone. But God can get through to anyone. But you are an ambassador for Jesus. And you are engaged in this. And Paul is saying exactly that. That they were obedient and had fear and trembling in the receiving of Titus and Paul and their message. I think because they had been burned or knew the sense of how awful living a life of sin and outside of God can be. And I'm going to say again, it does not have to be that way. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you for my, what does he say? The yoke is easy and my burden is, and it's true. It's living a life in rebellion to God that brings such stinky heaviness. And it doesn't have to be that way. Why? Because you have a God of grace and is doing this to you even right now with whatever you've got going on in your life, he's doing this. He is saying, come. Our last verse is verse 16. I rejoice, therefore, that I have confidence in you in all things. Why? Why? Why can Paul have confidence in the Corinthians? Why can Paul have confidence in the Corinthians? All right, so... I'm going to tell you about my daughter, Lydia, and it's just a parental illustration. She's not here, and I'm not responsible if she's not here for what I say about her that you tell her about. So just don't tell her. <laughs> but she's, she's in college, and she's a sinner, but I believe her heart loves the Lord. If you're a parent here who's had kids grow up, graduate out of your house, you will always find that you wish you had more time. That the time we have is not enough. But it's not supposed to be. The reason it's not is because they have to have God themselves. They have to walk with God themselves. They have to love God themselves and not do what they do in life because mom or dad said so, but because they love Jesus. So the confidence I have in Lydia is this, and I've said these things to her. Um, you know, we've raised you to walk with God and you've proven, you've shown to us that you love him and that you're honoring him and you're trying to. And out of that display of life comes a freedom and a confidence. Matter of fact, one of the things that we find uh, when they go to school is that maybe they're going to meet somebody and you're going to find out about them. And, and, and I told my daughter early on, you know what? Um, we have confidence in the God that leads you. And if there's somebody in your life someday that you bring before us, your mom and I aren't going to be standing over here saying, uh, you know, uh, we don't want that person in your life. We don't like this about this or this about that. We're going to give you counsel and guidance, but we trust your love of God and God himself to guide you. And what it does is it gives us a confidence because of their right choices. And in those right choices becomes a freedom. A freedom and, can I say, a protection you know, parents, and by the way, I'm not throwing stones at this term. You've heard the term helicopter parents. Helicopter parents cannot all the time be helicopter parents because there's going to be a day where your child has to make a choice on their own. And you better, and I better, be praying and teaching them how to make that choice. But it's their love of God that's going to bring them to making the right choice or not. 
I only brought my daughter into the conversation to say that that's the sentiment I have towards Lydia because of her love for Christ. And that love of Christ gives me confidence. Not that she won't do something wrong in the future. If she does, yell at her on Facebook or something. Go ahead. <laughs> but it's, it's that person's desire to walk with God that gives you confidence. And can I say, that's what Paul was saying to the church. And that's what God, I think, wants to be said of this church. That he has confidence in you that you will do the right thing. That you'll love God. That you'll walk with him. That you'll be surrendered. And can I say as I end, this is normal Christianity. That's what Christianity looks like. If there's something wrong, God is welcoming you right now. And let's fix the broken. Let's be obedient to him. And by God's grace, by God's grace, may we look like Jesus.